Welcome back to the Black Letter Podcast. We set out to create an entertaining and exciting podcast about law and business, and I think we've done it. Black Letter, the name, comes from the Gothic typeset that was originally used in the Gutenberg Press. Over time, Black Letter became the only font that English law books were printed in. Everything else was printed in regular type. It made it harder for kind of the common person to understand what the English law books said. Black Letter came to represent something that was law, that was set in stone, that was sort of old and a well-settled fundamental principle of law. We're here to demystify Black Letter law. We're here to demystify things that happen in business and law and where those two meet. And I hope you have fun listening. Welcome back to another episode of the Black Letter Podcast. Tom Dunlap, your host, and joining me today is Marissa Levin. Marissa is the co-founder of a company called Successful Culture International, and she is famous, folks. She's written <laughs> multiple books. One of those books called Built to Scale, How Top Companies Create Breakthrough Growth Through Exceptional Advisory Boards. But one I think that's even more important to our conversation today is called My Company Rocks, Eight Secrets to growth driven culture that keep employees happy and engaged. And Marissa, I don't know if you've got like the book covers there. Oh, I just, um, yeah, I held up while you were reading. Yeah. Built nice. To Built to scale. So that's one of the yeah. books. And the other one is one keeping of. employees happy and engaged. So she, she's famous. She writes for um, Smart CEO and Inc. And, uh, and has her own company that does this, that helps people move, transition CEOs and C-level people and all kinds of managers from where they According again, Marissa, I read this, so you can correct me, from where they are to where they want to be, right? Yeah, to help uh, leaders build cultures and organizations where they can reach their highest leadership potential, the organization can reach its potential, and its people can reach their potential. Gotcha. And, and so I know you're also on um, an organization with two of my partners, Roy and Cheryl Lynn. You're on EO, Entrepreneurs Organization, I think, in D.C.? So I used to be a member of EO. I was a member of EO DC, EO Baltimore. I helped to stand up their accelerator program, which is for okay. 250K to a million, which served really as a feeder system for EO. Um, I served on the global board for a minute in their area to be able to help get more women in the, in the organization. I'm no longer active in EO because one of the things that I'm very intentional about is where we're directing our energy. I'm involved gotcha. in a couple other groups. I'm involved in Cadre, which is okay. yep. a fee-based organization. I'm a founding member of that, which has been around for wow. 10 years. And then I'm a member of a, a global organization uh, called Maverick. And um, that is an organization of real game changers and life changers. Uh, it's global. And really, we're all very much committed to... Um, really edging the consciousness of the world ahead by at least one degree. We're really using our gifts and our talents and our network and our influence to make the world better. It's a very mission-driven organization with very high-level thinkers. So okay. Really exciting. Most of our viewers or listeners, I think we have a lot more listeners than viewers, probably because of my face, but most of them are either lawyers or uh, they're in-house counsel and we have some you know some business listeners as well ceos coos or and what i found really interesting about kind of the write-up on you and your what you do is right now we're obviously in a very unique and challenging time it's like spanish influenza on steroids because we went from a very connected culture where you know we had personal connections to you know being locked in houses and still being able to talk to each other but not having a personal connection and for me this has been a dramatic change. I'm a go-to-lunch guy, mm -hmm. shake hands guy, spend time with people guy. It's just my personality, and it's awful. I was telling you before the show, I, at my office, we have an office. I put on a mask, walk down the hall, say hi to people, walk back to my office, take the mask off, and go back to work. And it's, sure. it's changed from that kind of casual interaction with your fellow workers and your employees to this kind of weird, we have, didn't do our annual picnic, we didn't do our annual yeah. client events, our partner meeting. We, do, we fly everybody in every year. And last year we did axe throwing in DC. We can't do any of that. And so right. how do we keep, how do we create a growth driven culture that keep employees happy and engaged or partners engaged? How do we engage? Yeah. And it's tough. And I can relate to you 
Thomas, because my first company is a company called Information Experts that this year is 28 years old. I left it eight years ago, but I grew it to about 13 million uh, before I left. And uh, culture, obviously, for me was so important, making sure that people were connected. So I understand and empathize with the CEOs that, you know, are really committed to making sure that their people feel connected to an organization, to one another, and to a leadership team. You know, when all of this started happening and, you know, the pandemic started, you know, rolling out and, uh, you know, making its way through the United States, where my mind went was this is going to be an incredible challenge for leaders and organizations because most organizations do not have full remote workforces, you know, and really, really robust uh, telecommuting policies. And even those that do, those policies are voluntary. They're not right. forced upon you, right? You're not dealing with employees that have tremendous other stressors because they have so much uncertainty regarding their health or their finances, or all of a sudden they are locked in a house with people uh, that, you know, and their family members that they have to be with 24 seven, their kids are home from school and they're working at home or the college students are back home or they're in the same house with their spouse working at their dining room table. I mean, whoever would have thought that this is where we would have been. And so what we've observed over the last seven months at Successful Culture International with all of the companies that we work with and, you know, I coach CEOs and I, mean, I you know, I work with dozens of leaders and what we have found is that there is no right or wrong way to be doing this. Okay. And we have advised our clients, our executives and our leaders is they have to be fully transparent and vulnerable, honestly, with their people because they are figuring this out every day as they go along, just like their people are. What we have found right. while there is still like a, a bifurcation you know, between the leadership and the employees, in many ways, everybody is in the same boat, trying to figure this out every day as they go along. And leaders need leadership, but they really need empathy okay. and to understand that they've been seen. And one of the things that I created in response to this entire pandemic is a model called GRACE. It stands for grit, resilience, adaptability, connection, and empathy. And it equips leaders with the skill sets and the tools and the mindset and the resources to lead and communicate with grace throughout this entire pandemic and in the new world. So how do leaders tap into their own grit? How do they tap into their own resilience? How do they embrace the mindset of adaptability, meaning that what they thought was going to be the future and what they thought you know, that how their organization was going to be growing, they have to be able to let go of that so that they can make room for embracing new ideas. And so how do you as a leader embrace the idea of adaptability, which I had to do multiple times building my first company, and also convey the mindset of adaptability to employees? And then how do you ensure that you are connecting with your employees from a place of empathy and compassion? And they're two types of empathy that we teach in this program, in the Grace Leadership okay. Program. There's cognitive empathy and there's emotional empathy. And leaders want to be in the place of cognitive empathy where they are able to take the perspective of their employees, but not get fully emotionally engaged so that they're ineffective in terms of being able to help them through things. And then they want to attach compassion to that, which means that they're offering support. So we provide training on how leaders can truly lead and communicate with grace through this entire situation, knowing that every day might be a little bit different. There's no one way to do this, but across every organization we've seen in every industry, every size business, what we're finding is that leaders need to find ways to truly emotionally connect with their people so that they feel seen and heard and connected to the organizational mission and connected to the leadership in ways that they've never done before. So when you talk about cognitive empathy, for example, well, is that kind of an intentional empathy? Because for a lot of leaders, it's something that, you know, as a leader, you can set policy and you can say, you can telecommute. And, and if you have kids, you can stay home these days. You can essentially set work policies. 
But when you say cognitive empathy versus emotional empathy, what is cognitive empathy, I guess, is, is what, I'm, what I'm really driving at. So cognitive empathy is really the idea of taking perspective, of being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes, but not yeah. to so fully engage with them that you're in it with you with them and you can't help. So the best type of empathetic leadership is cognitive empathetic leadership with compassion. And the compassion is where you offer ways to support them. When people are emotionally empathetic, it means that they are so far in it with them that they're not even able to provide support. And that's gotcha. not helpful. Gotcha. It's really being empathetic with a little bit of distance so that you can remain objective and being able to provide support. It's it's a full, we teach it in the GRACE program, the differences between cognitive empathy and emotional empathy. So it's saying that you understand their plight and you mm -hmm. see that the stressors and the pressures they're going through, but at the same time, leaders have a business to run. So you have they to do. say, I understand what you're doing. We have to meet the business's goals. Let's try to mesh those two things together. We're not yeah. going to set aside your concerns for that. I'm going to acknowledge them and address them as best we can. Because you can't always, I mean, we, we have 150 employees and we cannot, mm -hmm. for each one of them, you know, make an individualized policy. We have to be kind of broad. And then when huge things come up for an individual, we had one person in one of our offices, not in the DC metro area, in an office far away from the DC metro area, don't worry, but come up with COVID. And so, you know, yeah. that was kind of a, kind of a shock because zero people at the whole firm so far. And then, you know, one person, that was a, an opportunity for us to, I think, exercise some cognitive empathy more directly. But I think, and so just to ask you, what can a leader do on a, on a larger scale instead of a case by case basis to show their employees that they're willing to engage in cognitive empathy, or I don't know if it's a policy driven perspective, but what are the, what are the actions a leader could take? Such a great question. So in addition to doing the regular business check-ins, you know, where things are going regarding milestones that need to be met, projects that need to be completed, goals that need to be achieved, what types of touch points and check-ins is the leader doing that recognizes the human side of the okay. employee, right? Like, are they, are they doing individual check-ins? Do they have a phone tree? You know, if you have 150 people, I don't know what your organizational structure is, but, you know, is there a way that you can make sure that every employee is getting some type of touch point on a regular basis, that it's just a human check-in. That's one thing that they can be doing. Another thing is um, there are creative ways that organizations can connect with their people that go beyond just the standard like happy hour. Like let's show up at 5 p.m. Eastern and everybody has a drink in their hand and then we'll cheer to the weekend. Like there are a lot of other creative things that can be done. There are different gifts that can be sent to people. I mean, we have one client that they sent neck pillows, you know, to their employees because everybody is sitting in their chair right. all the time. So what are some creative things that you can do? I have a client that is still holding their uh, annual employee retreat. And what they've done is they've arranged with a catering company to make sure that every employee is getting lunch delivered at their house at the same time so that everybody will take their lunch break together. And what that does is it takes the pressure off of the employee for getting up and going, I don't have anything in the house. What am I gonna have for lunch? Right. And they know that they're having a decent lunch and they can choose to eat it, either eat it with the company, like literally sitting at their desk, or maybe they wanna go off camera. But what can companies do to still create a sense of cohesiveness, but at the same time, keep the business running? So. There's a lot of creative things that people can be doing. What other types of touch points do you have? Are you sending out an internal newsletter? You as the, as the leader and the CEO yeah. doing some video messaging that you can be sending out. You can be doing an online book club for employees. Like we used to have a book club at my, my first company that we obviously met in the conference room. You can still move that online. My company... We have a full scale academy, Successful Culture Advanced Leadership Education Academy. We do training on conscious and unconscious bias in the workplace, emotional intelligence, self-awareness, communication skills, having difficult conversations, leading remote teams. Those types of soft skills are the critical skills that leaders need. And so we provide all of that online now, and it's highly, highly interactive. And so those types of training and education programs are really important for corporate culture now.
So there's lots of things that companies can be doing to keep their people engaged and make sure that they feel seen and heard. So what, what do you think during this pandemic is the biggest mistake that companies are making that you see over and over again when it comes to culture and communication? I would say that the leaders are not bringing their true selves, that employees feel very distant from their people, okay. that, that from their leaders. I also think that this is the time, um, and this is something that we're doing with a lot of our clients, to revisit what your core values are and your mission is to make sure that that is fully reinforced with your organization so that people know what you stand for, know why you exist, and that they feel connected to something bigger than themselves. Where we are finding the disconnect with employees and their organizations is they're losing sight of why they're doing what they're doing. Can I just ask, that seems to tie to me something that I've heard over and over again, and I see it sometimes too, that the reason a lot of people are at work, not necessarily because they love the work, but it's because of the people they work with. And in this atmosphere where you're isolated, it certainly changes that dynamic and a lot of the reason people might or might not show up. Is that, is that something you... So that, yeah, that's definitely a, a key reason why people show up at work. And so what we've done again um, with our scale Academy and the leadership education and training, you know, that we do on the, on the programs that we provide, they're highly interactive with a lot of breakout rooms. So, and they often last, like, we don't do just like one, one hour program, our programs, they run, you know, four to six months. So there's a different training, like, you know, there'll be like a two hour training every, you know, every other week, right. for four to six months. And so, wow. because, yeah, I mean, our, our programs are, are, are phenomenal and yeah. it's, it's been amazing the impact and the way that we are equipping leaders and employees with navigating difficult conversations, raising their emotional intelligence, being aware of any unconscious bias they may have so that we're bringing more equity into the workplace. All of that is really important with what's going on, you know, in the world right now. But the way that we have structured our programs, and I can only speak to how we're providing education, is that they're highly interactive and they create very strong trust-based cohorts so that people feel really connected to their employee, to their coworkers, and they're having really meaningful conversations on a sustained period of time. So that's how we're making sure that there's a lot of emotional connection among the employees with the leadership team and and to the organization it's really three-pronged it's how do you keep the employees connected to one another how do okay. you keep them connected to the organizational mission and core values and how do you keep them connected to the leadership team and so that's how we structure our our programs and our engagements and then the other thing that organizations can be doing and again this is just talking about our own best practices and our own company and, and what we're doing for our clients is doing the cultural assessments, which is something we've always done because there's always a disconnect between what the leaders think the culture is and what really is happening. And so okay. we often do cultural assessments so that leaders can be aware of the gaps. And the sooner they're aware of the gaps, the sooner they can fill the gap before they snowball into something that really can be unmanageable. So it's just it's staying in front of the, the little challenges and, and crevices that can pop up and filling them before they become something unmanageable. It's just really staying ahead of it all. Our particular organization, we're kind of dispersed. So everybody is during COVID, but yeah. even when we're not in COVID, we're in like seven offices across the country. So mm -hmm. we have micro cultures, I would call them. You do. Yeah. Yes, I would different you culture. Do. Yeah. Office by office. I mean, even in Northern Virginia, Tyson's Corner is massively different than Richmond or than Leesburg. Just, just I would bet. How do you do a cultural assessment across an entity or do you do micro culture assessments and then try to synthesize them? Because I feel like what might work in Leesburg, because it's mostly an administrative, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, patent prosecution, trademark product, but Tyson's Corner is a lot of partners, like very yeah. like tons of high level, you know, power guys and gals. And uh, how, how do you, you know, how do you do that? I'll share like a little mini case study with another sure. company we work yeah. with. So they are, they're a publicly traded company. So we, one of our clients is a, a huge publicly traded company. What we did before we designed the, or customized the training program that we did 
is we did do a full needs assessment within the organization and a cultural assessment. They were very focused on creating a culture of inclusion, working on the, you know, the inclusion and the diversity and the equity and making sure that they had a very safe working environment for all of their people. That was their main driver. And so okay. the assessment that we had to do, we had to ask some really difficult questions. And this is a company that has call centers in the South. Their headquarters are located in the Mid-Atlantic and the Northeast. They've got uh, uh, different offices out on the West Coast in California. You can imagine the diversity of the right, culture of cultures. Yeah. Yeah, in that organization, not only because of geographical locations, but because of the jobs that are being done. I mean, you've got a call center in the South, right? They're having a whole different experience under that brand than the company, you know, than, than the people in the Midwest and then corporate in the Northeast. So we did do very specific assessments because what we got back was, you know, like literally four or five different companies under an umbrella. And so as we roll out our training in response to that, we're tweaking our training according to each location. Like we are aware that in California, where it's a lot more progressive and a lot more, honestly, you know, more diverse and more sensitive to the equity issues that are going on than perhaps their Southern, you know, counterparts, the facilitators that we have delivering our training, including myself, our facilitators, and this is so important for any company that is bringing in training, uh, especially online, in any event, the facilitators need to be excellent. It's not just about the content. So our facilitators each, we all have a minimum of 25 years of facilitation experience. We are varsity players when it comes to facilitation because if you put a junior varsity player in front of a room of executives who have 30 years experience in the field and you put a junior facilitator in front of them, right. the room is going to eat them alive right. and will lose all credibility. So you need to make sure your facilitators, when you're providing training, especially in this, in this world and in this era when patience is short and tolerance is short, you need to make sure your facilitator is a master at not only facilitating difficult content, but moving the, the participants through the program in a way that, that maintains credibility and respect throughout the whole program. So it's about the, the quality of the content and it's about the quality and expertise of the facilitator. Both so, of them are equally important. So that's how we deal with different cultural discrepancies okay. in an organization. So I've been through some facil facilitations. I don't know what they're called. Some facilitator managed retreats. I've been yeah. on the boards of charitable organizations of a hospital once where they did it. And it was good. It was interesting and good. And a lot of the value for me in that was sitting in the room with the other people and doing these mm -hmm. little breakout groups or exercises or whiteboard things. Yeah. A lot of it was just direct interaction. So how do you, because I imagine everybody's doing this by video and I struggle yeah. with this when we do yeah. company meetings, like how do you keep people engaged? Because I can do this. Yep. No, I'm still listening. We're good. And I'm over here playing like you know, I'm watching TikTok or something. Right. I'm yeah. not, but you know that yeah. you know it's hard to. Uh, how do you keep people in in, even if Great they don't want to be in? When you're there, they don't have a choice. They have to be in. But people who don't want to be there, uh, you know, get sucked in when it's in person. Yeah. Again, getting back to what I said, the facilitator has to be a master. So we will not bring in any facilitators that don't have at least twenty to twenty five years experience. And the content needs to be designed and delivered in such a way that it is highly interactive. So our work, our programs are highly interactive. Makes sense. We, yeah. make, we take advantage of the breakout rooms on a regular basis. Like we probably have three to four different breakout sessions in one course. We okay. take advantage of the chat. Like we'll, we'll do a group activity and they'll have to put all of their answers in the chat. And we have a lot of provocative questions. Like we have a lot of, a lot of engagement and we also limit the number of people in our programs really to like no more than 15 or 16 so then we have the breakout rooms 
that will go into like groups of four. And so we have, we have opportunity for self-reflection for the larger group engagement. And then we also have the breakout rooms and it's all, I mean, we move fast and our content is good. And we bring in, you know, different videos from other experts. So it's not just our voice. We bring in leadership experts to be able to complement whether it's, you know, Simon Sinek or John Maxwell or right. um, you know, other leaders that we bring in through video. We're very, very focused on making sure that, that there's a very high level of interactivity and engagement. We don't let anyone off the hook. Everybody has to feel engaged. So, so I like that. So I, I think that applies to any video conference you have with more than one person, interactivity, speed, uh, content, very high level content and provocative. I mean, I guess I could just ask everybody who they're voting for every 15 minutes. That would be provocative, but, uh, but no, I get what you mean. Provocative and relevant to the subject matter. So that's, that's really good advice. Thank you for that. So everything we've talked about today is useful and good. And there's a lot of content there and you guys do a lot yourselves as a company to bring this to other companies. What are the three things that you would say to our listeners today, to the the GCs or the attorneys who advise companies uh, that they should kind of take away with them and share with their clients or if they're a CEO, share with their company and think about the three biggest things or two or four, whatever number you like. People tend to like threes. So I always go three. The first thing, you know, relative to what leaders should be doing, as I mentioned, is that leaders, they need to be accessible and available. And quite frankly, they need to be transparent. And what I mean by that is that they need to say to their people, look, I'm figuring this out alongside of you. I've never led during a pandemic. I'm, I'm not sure what the right way to do it is. I'm checking best practices. I'm keeping up with what, you know, my industry peers are doing. I'm making sure that I'm aware of, you know, health, the, the health requirements, but I am figuring this out as, as we go along. Okay. And with that being said, I want your input, like what works for you as an employee in this firm and you solicit their input so that people feel that they're being heard and you let people know that what is in place today may not be in place next week, that this is a dynamic, moving, shifting, fluid environment, which means okay. that you may establish a protocol yes. today and say, you know what, we're doing shifts. You know, shift A is going to come in on Mondays and Wednesdays and Fridays, and shift B is going to come in on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Right. You may do shifts, but you might find that that's not working. So you need to give yourself room and flexibility to say, we're, sh we're switching it up because it's not working for whatever reason, right? You need to be cognitively accessible and transparent. Cognitively accessible and transparent, and you need to let people know that you know what's in place today may not be in place tomorrow. Um, okay. So that's one thing. And Flexible. I want to point out that, yeah, and that's where the adaptability comes in in the GRACE model, the grit, resilience, okay. adaptability, connection, and empathy. And if you look at that model, really what I'm going to be suggesting really uh, you know, lines up with that. So that flexibility is with the adaptability. The grit and resilience. Leaders need to make sure that they are recharging also. They need to make sure that they're giving themselves the time and the space that they need to take care of themselves. As I like to say, we can't pour from an empty cup. So if we're not taking care of ourselves, we cannot you know, nurture and take care of others. So self-care in this era of what's going on is paramount. And I'm extremely self-focused on self-care, whether it's making sure I'm exercising every day. I meditate every day. I'm very focused on what I eat and how I care for my body. And what's something else that's really important is I really limit my content diet. That's what I call it. I basically pay attention to what I need to know in order to stay healthy. And I ignore the rest. I don't watch a lot of news. I don't watch the presidential debates. I stay away from all the political rhetoric that's out there. And I focus on how can I, how can I keep my mind in a very elevated state of positivity so that I can be my best to be able to help others move forward. Right. Do not get sucked into that. TikTok's so, a rabbit hole. Yeah, although I, I tried it for five minutes and my kids freaked out and I was like, I'm not doing it anymore. It's fine. Yeah, my it, it is son, a rabbit hole. My older son, who's 23, he he does a really good job of, of curating some really good TikToks that we <laughs> laugh. We laugh nonstop and laughing, laughter obviously is really important right now. So self-care, you know, bringing your whole self, being vulnerable 
to your people and being transparent in, tr in terms of like what you know and, and what you don't know and giving yourself room to be able to shift. And then the third thing is to be really intentional about connecting with your people on a human level. So those are probably the three main things. And then the one thing I want to add is every organization has policies for, you know, PTO and, and maternity leave or bereavement leave or, you know, mental health days or sick leave. And those are all based on compliance and they are predictable and they're legal, you know, they're, they're legal policies. Right. Where we are right now with COVID as people figure out how do I bring people back? Who do I bring back? What does it look like? There's no playbook on how to do this. Nothing is standardized. So people are operating from a place of fear and literally like, like taking stabs in the dark. Yeah. And, yeah. and so, so that's why leaders have the to- The government's doing the same thing. They're changing the laws every six weeks. Everybody's <laughs> trying to figure it out. And that's yeah. why we need to really give ourselves grace when we're moving through this. Wait, Marissa, where can people find out more about Grace? Is there a, a website or is it in one of the books you've already done or is it, is it something that's new? It is new. Our website is successfulculture.com. I believe the white paper that's available for download on there is really, it's more about conscious and unconscious bias and creating a respectful work environment. Okay. But hey, anyone who wants to uh, get the white paper and the information on Grace they can email me at marissa at successfulculture.com. That's M-A-R-I-S-S-A, -S 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 marissa at successfulculture.com. I'm happy to provide that. And uh, I would encourage everyone to connect with me on LinkedIn. I post a lot of content about strategies that we're just talking about today. And I'm at, you know, I think it's Marissa 11 one. I'm not sure, but I'm all over LinkedIn. Folks, thanks for joining us on the Black Letter Podcast. Marissa Levin. Her book, My Company Rocks, Eight Secrets to Growth-Driven Culture and Built to Scale, and she has that book there, uh, both probably available on Amazon, if I don't miss my guess. Um, yep, they're both on Amazon. Yep, so. everything on earth is, and certainly yeah. these uh, good books are. And of course, successfulculture.com. You can find her white paper, email her, and we'll pop her link up for LinkedIn, connect with Marissa for more information. Thanks for joining us again on another great episode of Black Letter. Download us wherever you get your podcasts from the Apple Store or Google Play, and we'll see you next time on Black Letter. That's all for today's episode of Black Letter. Thanks again for listening. Join us next time when we talk about more Black Letter issues in creative ways. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and Google Play so you never miss an episode. And to catch us on video, check out our website at blackletterstudios.com.